Shared decision making is something that's been quite well described and quite prevalent really within healthcare settings recently. But it's surprisingly difficult for clinicians to really integrate shared decision making into their practice. And we were interested in how that might apply to a condition like tinnitus, because tinnitus is a chronic condition and it's a condition with a very heterogeneous population where there are a wide range of different responses. So we wanted to make sure that the offering that clinicians make to their patients is well matched by the preferences that patients have for treatment. One of the audiologists here. Do you mind if I check? There were three stages to the research. First stage involved some qualitative interviews with patients with tinnitus to find out what their preferences are for treatment and what their preferences are for outcomes of treatment. The second stage involved videos of interactions between clinicians and patients with tinnitus to observe and describe how those decisions are made in clinical practice. And then thirdly, taking the findings from the two earlier stages to develop the decision aid. Easy, straightforward. We had a really great research team. We had three researchers who were involved in day-to-day -day gathering of data. And then we had a wider research group, which included people from health and clinical psychology backgrounds and clinical scientists and experts in tinnitus. And we also had patients who have tinnitus as part of our steering group as well. Typically, there are three phases in clinical encounters where there's an opportunity to incorporate shared decision making. The first phase is the building of the relationship between the clinician and the patient so that the patient's preferences are heard and form part of the information that the clinician gathers. The second phase is around weighing up the different options that exist for the treatment, in this case for tinnitus, and comparing the kind of pros and cons of the different treatments. The third phase is weighing up the final decision. So that's about integrating the preferences that people hold with the pros and cons that have been discussed about each individual treatment option. These video examples are based on some of the observations that we've made, which reveal some typical practices within audiology. And what we have tried to do is to ask real clinicians and real patients to mock up some of the typical encounters that go on, but also to illustrate some of the alternatives so that they can demonstrate how it is that shared decision making could be incorporated into clinical encounters. Okay, do you want to come on in? And I'm the senior therapist here. I'm just going to see you today and talk to you about um, our tinnitus clinic. I was just, I was looking at your details and having a read of your journal and just seeing um, uh, what we've been doing with you so far. So I was just having a look at it. Um, uh, have we fitted you with hearing aids yet? I think we have, haven't we? Yeah. Yes, yeah. two hearing aids. Yeah, that's yes, right. Yes, that's right. So do you think that they've helped with the tinnitus at all? Helped with the tinnitus? Yes. Do, does the tinnitus seem better when you're wearing your hearing aids? No, I don't think so. No, not at all. Is, it, is that does supposed it, to be the case? What, I mean, does the tinnitus sound quieter or, um, well, just less obvious when you're wearing your hearing aids? I don't know. I think it's two different things. OK. What I notice about that interaction is that the clinician isn't inviting the patient into a collaborative relationship at all. She gives her professional role. And often it's the simple things like introducing yourself, giving your name, maybe giving your professional role, and then asking the patient what they'd like to be known as. And that gives the patient a voice right from the outset and invites them in that this is a relationship. And I think that's really important to do to remember those really simple things. Alongside that, one of the things that she did was she used the screen as her primary source of information. So she wasn't really even looking at the patient initially to gather information about how the patient was. She was using the authority of the kind of medical records and the, the previous history that she had to determine what she was going to talk about with the patient. What also I noticed was the, the focus on the medical diagnosis and the hearing aids, but little questioning of the patient around their personal preferences for why they were there today. So 
the, the, the mismatch between the medical preference versus the patient's preference can end up with what's known as a silent misdiagnosis, the, the failure to diagnose the patient's preference. So did your tinnitus start suddenly or gradually? It was gradually. It was quite gradual. Um, what time of day do you notice your tinnitus? Is it in the morning in, or it's in the in evening? The, it's at night, really. Which ear have you got your tinnitus in? Is it's it in the right my or left the left ear. And what does your tinnitus sound like? It sounds like um, if you're in an air, aircraft, you hear the background noise of the aircraft the whole time in your ear. Um, but sometimes uh, there is um, a high-pitched tone that, that, that runs through it as well. Has it ever changed in loudness? Um, no, but sometimes it changes in, um, in its form. Very occasionally it changes in its form. The clinician is asking a number of interview-style questions. She's not allowing the patient to tell their tinnitus story. In fact, she closes him down because he goes, um, as if he wants to go on and tell more, and she asks the next question. And also, she asks him a question, and he gives a lovely metaphor about what it sounds like. And he's very eloquent and very detailed in that. And that's ignored. That's not, no attention to that detail is paid. And therefore, she then asks her next question. So there's so many missed opportunities there to really engage with the patient and his story. What's interesting about that is that nothing she's doing there is technically wrong. She's answering or asking all the questions to gather the information that she's required to get for each encounter from her questionnaire. But it's questionable, I suppose, how much of that information is really going to make much of a difference to her management plan with him or to thinking about variations in treatment um, and by asking those questions she's really holding a lot of responsibility for expertise she's suggesting that the answer to that question makes a difference and that she has knowledge about what difference it will make that's important to know whether the tinnitus is in the left or the right ear you can you can gather that information by using open-ended questions and you can piece together the information that's relevant and important but in a, in a more patient-centred way. And the patient feels that he's had the time to tell the story, which is mm. important. How are you today? I'm well. I'm well, thanks. Good, brilliant. <laughs> Have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. So my name's Katie. I'm one of the audiologists here. Do you mind if I check your full name with you, first of all? George Stuart Cuthbert. Brilliant. But I like to be known as Stuart. OK, excellent, Stuart. All right, so we've got some time together today, and what I'd really like to do is to find out sort of how your tinnitus is affecting you, uh, what you're doing at the moment, sort of manage your tinnitus. Yeah. Um, and then we'll have a look at together maybe areas you may not have thought about, which may be helpful right. to you going forward. Right. Um, so first of all, sort of tell me, how is your, does your tinnitus affect you? It's crept up on me, but it hasn't really affected what I do. Okay. Um, it's just that um, I have um, I, I've adapted to what I think is, is, is a way of coping with it. Mm. So how is it for you at the moment? At the moment, it's, it's very good. Is there anything that worries you about your tinnitus at all? It's the absence of total silence, mm. which I would, I would love, but it's just the knowledge that I will never hear total silence again. Which is quite hard. But, isn't but it? it's quite hard, but, mm. you know. So a very different start to this encounter. A really good introduction and setting up the working alliance to say, this is why we're here, this is who I am, what would you like to be known as? These are the parameters of our session. So really setting up the working alliance. And then going on to bear witness to this patient's story and being really empathic and using, you can see the difference in the nonverbal communication here. She really listens and is empathic to his description of that never um, being able to hear total silence. And when we 
know that the clinician is empathic and that they're trying to understand it from our perspective, we're much more likely to engage in the interaction. We're much more likely to feel that we're part of that decision-making process. And we can feel empathic, but we need to communicate that empathy to the patient. And this was what was happening here. Really important. That's really interesting about how she demonstrates empathy. She just takes time to listen to his description about the absence of silence and the loss of that for him. And rather than trying to make that better or to remove it or to brush over the sadness of that moment, she stays with him in that moment and just acknowledges it. And I think there's something really helpful for people about being heard when they describe something really sad like that. Okay, I had a look at your hearing test. Yeah. Um, I think that hearing aids might be a good idea for you to help you with your tinnitus. Really? Does that um, does does tinnitus and hearing go together? Hearing loss can do. Some people have um, tinnitus. Uh, well, I'm not have aware. Loss. I'm not aware that I have uh, hearing loss. In fact, the last time I was at the audiology department. They told me that um, for my age, um, my, my hearing was quite good. OK, I've just had a look at your hearing test and yes. it looks like there is some hearing loss there. Really? So I think it would be a really good idea to try and correct okay. that for you, maybe okay. help you, distract you more from your tinnitus. Tinnitus, right, OK. I would really sort of recommend that. Fine. So in that clip, she's discussing the results of the hearing test, but she goes straight on to talking about a decision, a treatment, hasn't discussed with the patient the pros and cons of the, the option of the hearing aids, and hasn't at all elicited the patient's opinion on that as a treatment option. In this case, Katie's very much setting herself up to be the expert in the encounter and in the room. So she is holding a lot of responsibility for prescribing an option to her patient and, and trying to convince him that it's the right way to go. She even uses the terminology, I'd like to help to co correct that for you, rather than shall we think about ways of correcting that with you. And if you look at his body language, she says, you know, I, I really recommend that. And he says, fine. And it's very obvious that this patient isn't fine. He's had no time at all to absorb the information that he has hearing loss when he was expecting not to have hearing loss. And he's going along with the expert, fine. But his body language is indicating that, that that's not how he's feeling. And the clinician doesn't recognise that. Is there anything else you want to add to what we've already discussed? Um, yes. Um, where do we go now? Is there anything else that uh, I, could, I could try that might uh, help? All right, well, let's spend a bit of time sort of discussing that now. Right. Uh, you've given me a lot of really, really good information about how you're already sort of managing which may tie into some of the options, but maybe there are a few other ones that you could consider as right. well. We can consider together, and then you can decide if you think that would be a good thing for right. you. Okay. Right. So we've sent this to you already. So yes, I hope I've seen you've that. been able to have a good look at that. Yes. Any questions before we start, or do you feel like you've got a good understanding about I've what I've got a reasonable understanding, and I can identify with certain um, aspects of this that um, apply to me. Um, the one that I would like explored, possibly, would be the group support. Okay. So what's really nice about that clip is how the clinician starts with a nice wide open question which gives the patient space and opportunity to then bring up other things that are important to them. Yeah, the clinician is really demonstrating to the patient that she's listened, understood the situation in the story that the patient is telling before then going on to the decision-making phase. And what's lovely is that there's enough space there for that individual to state his preference, and it's a preference that 
wouldn't necessarily have come up through any of the previous conversations if he hadn't seen the information about the options that were available to him. And being able to choose and being able to look at all the options and decide which option fits his own preferences and values. And what's clear is that she has sent this decision aid out in the post before this appointment. And I think what's useful about that is that it gives somebody a chance to have a read through and to share the information that they've got with their friends and families to start weighing up the pros and cons of the different options and also to start thinking about the questions or extra information that they need so that they can get the most out of their encounter with their clinician. Some people prefer, rather than being in a one-to-one -one session, to be with other people in a group session. Um, they feel it might give them a bit more structure, get a bit of feedback from other people. Yeah, I think that would be better because in a one-to-one -one situation, I'm likely to be upset every time that it's not going away. Yes. But in a group, you know, there's distractions. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's a really good place to start is to choose the right environment for yourself. The group that we do here that is very much specifically to talk about tinnitus. That's why I'm here. Yes, okay. Yeah. The interesting thing here is that Mel is describing how that service works in practice in that local area to help uh, Jean decide whether it's the right thing for her to do. And it's that sort of local knowledge and extra information that the clinicians really need to supply at this point to help with the sort of decision-making phase of the encounter. And it's a fine line, isn't it, between giving the information in a neutral way and saying this is what's available and leading the patient into a pathway that you would really like them to go down. Okay, so this is the tinnitus decision aid. It's a simple single side of A4 and you can use it on paper or you can download it and use it from a computer screen as well and it's easy enough to be mailed out to people along with other information at the start of an appointment. And it consists simply of a description of the four key evidence-based interventions for tinnitus. And they're kind of compared and contrasted, so weighing up pros and cons by the use of these frequently asked questions. And these frequently asked questions were derived from interview data with people that we spoke to about what they needed to know in order to make a decision about what to do for their tinnitus. It is easy to slip into bad habits. You know, you might be having a bad day, you've got sort of constant time constraints against you and you are seeing a lot of patients as well. The decision aid really sort of made me feel less overwhelmed with the amount of information that I might need to get over to someone and help me sort of structure it in a much easier way, in an understandable way. And also the patient had already had some experience of looking at the information. So you could sort of go through those options much more fluidly with someone and confident that the information you were given was good, consistent. Um, so yeah, it felt really, really nice actually. I think it can be difficult to change behaviours that we're all really used to using and when we get into clinical practice we very quickly develop routines and kind of scripts that we use and sometimes it can be quite tricky to alter those easily but I think that there is an enormous will amongst our clinical colleagues to really enable their patients to participate in the encounter. When you hear the difference that it makes to individual patients. When you hear the responses from patients afterwards, that in turn will convince people that it's the way to go. Oh yes, the decision aid certainly helped. It displays every scenario that you could imagine for different options that people can take. And there are two that just fit exactly, exactly my scenario. So. Uh, I'm very pleased with that.